Thank you, Joe. And uh, welcome, everyone. I hope everyone who did get uh, to try uh, go on the boat last night had an enjoyable time. Luckily, the rain did pass. Um, I very much enjoyed it. It was the first time I'd ever actually taken the architecture ride at night. So um, <clears throat> once again, thank you for coming. Uh, obviously, we have a very packed room, uh, which is always a good thing. Uh, we were expecting uh, about 85 to 90 state elected officials from more than 30 states. So we're really happy to have all you here. I hope you guys can talk together, learn about uh, solutions from other states. Um, kind of by a show of hands, I'm just kind of interested to see who has never been to an emerging issues forum in, in the room. So a, a lot of you, that's, that's great. Um, it's always good to have new faces, see a lot of friendly faces that we've had before as well. Um, but that's, we're really trying to grow out, have you introduce us to your colleagues, let them know about the Heartland Institute and the various things that we can provide them, whether it be new research and commentary, uh, expert testimony, expert speakers to come to your state. We can put on a kind of a mini EIF in your state. Uh, just talk to us and we'll see what we can do, depending you know, if it's on health care or budget and tax issues, whatever it may be. Um, last year, we actually testified in more than a dozen states in both chambers of Congress. Um, we hope to increase that number in the next year. Um, and uh, also, I wanted to uh, briefly talk about the Emerging Issues Forum um, itself. This is the eighth Emerging Issues Forum. We always do it. We usually do it in October or September uh, in conjunction with our annual benefit dinner. Um, this year we moved it up for two reasons. One, because NCSL was in town and we figured we could drag a couple of those legislators over here and give them kind of the free market view on public policy. Uh, the other reason was because obviously this is election year and hosting uh, one of these types of events for lawmakers in October is kind of difficult. Um, so today, um, as Joe mentioned, we're going to be covering kind of the four major topic areas, health care, uh, budget and tax energy and education. Um, I will kind of go into that a little bit more when we're uh, in the, the panel room. Um, but you also would, would have been given a binder as you checked in. Uh, those kind of give kind of Heartland's overview on all the different issues. Um, it also has a welcome letter from me. Um, uh, if you are a tweeter, uh, use, please use the hashtag EIF2012. We'd love to kind of get the, the information that you learn here uh, out there. Uh, the other thing is there is a survey in uh, the front of it. Uh, we would love for you guys to fill that out. Let us know what we're doing well, what we're not doing well, and if you would like to offer kind of a testimonial that we can uh, kind of use to uh, tell other legislators, tell our donors how well we're doing, we would really appreciate that. Um, that is invaluable to us to kind of get that sort of feedback. Uh, as Joe mentions, uh, I am Director of Government Relations. We have a, a, a team of about uh, six, I believe six people. We have Kendall Antikyer, who's in the back of the room. Uh, she does external relations and also kind of our healthcare expert. Uh, Taylor Smith over there, he's our policy analyst. He's mainly focused on energy and also some tax issues. So if you have any questions on those, please let us know. Um, Robin Knox, who's at registration, she kind of helps me run the ship right and make sure nothing falls through the cracks. Matthew Glanz, who is actually not here, he's actually at NCSL um, for the first half of the day. He covers, he's our senior policy analyst, so he's kind of an expert in a lot of different issues, especially finance, uh, budget and tax, insurance issues. Um, with that, uh, I would like to uh, introduce our first speaker, our first keynote speaker, who we're very, very happy to have. Uh, the Honorable Joe Walsh. In 2010, Joe Walsh was elected to Congress to represent the 8th District of Illinois. He has a long history of advocating on behalf of a number of public policy issues and causes, including the advancement of market-based solutions to education room, uh, education reform, and urban poverty. He also has a background in teaching at the high school and college level. He was born in the 8th District, where he currently lives with his white wife, Helen. So with that, I would like to introduce Congressman Joe Walsh. Thank you. I'm going to try to lower that. I'm going to turn this on. This could be tough for me, because I... Uh, typically don't stand, I think I've got that on. Everybody hear me? Yeah. Woohoo! 
Uh, I, I usually don't, hey, Tom Morrison, stand up, everybody. State Representative Tom Morrison from Palatine, Illinois. <laughs> a plug for the hometown boy. Um, I have always had a devil of a time standing behind a podium. I've been ordered to stand behind a podium. Typically, I'm, do, don't worry, I'll come back. I'm doing this, I'm doing this. I never stand still. But I've been given a six inch buffer on each side. I've been, oh, this is gonna be difficult. I've been given a six inch buffer on each side. Um, it's great to be here with you all. It sounds like you've got an interesting uh, and engaging day ahead of you. I don't know that this was mentioned in uh, what John said during his lovely intro of Congressman Joe Walsh. Um, I am a Heartland Institute alum. Uh, I worked at the Heart, come on, give it up. I worked with Joe and Diane Best in the Heartland Institute in the mid-90s, primarily on school reform, school choice, and school vouchers. Uh, it was a wonderful experience, and the Heartland Institute, for those of you who don't know, is an invaluable resource for what you all do. Use it. Use it as much as you can. I thought what I'd do is uh, take, not, not a lot of time, but take maybe 10, 15, 20 minutes and just give you an idea <laughs> of what's going on in Washington. And every time I say that, I do want to chuckle. Um, I do want to smirk. I do want to sometimes frown. But let me give you my perspective because, gosh, I, I think for what you all are doing, the more you clearly understand what Washington's doing and not doing and afraid to do uh, can only help you do your jobs. And then I'd be happy to, let's open this up to any questions you might have uh, about anything, about Washington, about our relationship, about this incredibly important election coming up. I don't know that I should be able to, I don't know that I'm able to dabble in politics here. We should be more focused on policy. So let me just get it out in one brief statement. If this country doesn't get things right this November, we're, we're done. Yeah. I want to say it again. Hey, Anthony, that was almost a YouTube moment. If we as a nation do not get it right this November, it will be extremely difficult to ever, ever, ever get back what this country was founded upon. That's, that's what's at stake. There, that's my politics. Um, I'm one of 87 Republican freshmen in Washington. Uh, we were sent there with a clear mission. I'll describe that mission in a moment. Um, but I want to start with a broader view. I'm going to give you my, my notion as to what I think the country is going through right now and how Washington's dealing with what the country's going through right now and then the impact on you. Most importantly, the impact on you. I was saying two years ago when I was running and I believe it even more now and when I said the following a couple years ago People looked at me and scratched their heads, and some shook their heads, but a few began to nod. When I say it now, I see a lot more heads nodding. This country we love, um, this country that, unlike any other country in the history of this planet, was founded upon a concept was founded upon an idea, an idea no, complicated, no more complicated than one word, freedom. Freedom. This country is going through a second American revolution. Nothing short of that. Nothing short of that. The Democratic Party in Washington gets that. 
because they're on one side in this revolution. The media doesn't get it at all, which is no surprise. I'm a Republican. For too long, my Republican Party in Washington hasn't understood what I mean when I say we're going through a revolution for the very soul of this country. And what we're doing is, what, what I mean by a revolution is, it's like you've got these two great visions of America that have collided, that have finally collided, and that are fighting. There's the vision that I would argue probably most people in this room still hold to, which is the vision our founders had, which is that you are free to live your life, you're free to keep the lion's share of what you make. There's this little thing called government that we keep over here. And you are free to live your lives and you're also responsible for your own life. That, that, that freedom concept, again, is what this country was founded upon. It's how we lived as a country for the first, we can debate it, the 100 or so years. But then about 100, 120, 130 or so years ago, things began to change from that original concept to where we live now to the America we live in now, to the America our kids are used to living in now, which basically is an America that says, you're not necessarily free anymore. The money you make isn't really yours, and so you're going to continue to give more and more of it to Washington and Springfield and every other state capital. And you are no longer going to be responsible for your own life. The church down the street isn't going to be responsible for you. Your neighborhood's not going to be responsible for you. Government's going to be responsible for you. And so we now live right now in this world where that, that, that government control vision of America, by the way, guys, that vision of America is winning out right now. We're losing. Those of us who believe in freedom are losing right now. I can tell you, I don't want to speak for anybody's state, but in Washington, we're losing right now. Now, thank God, it's always funny for me to say, but I'll say it. Thank God President Obama got elected. Thank God President Obama got elected. Because he helped wake up, I would argue, the freedom-loving Americans who still cling to that vision. It's an, it's an interesting discussion with a glass of wine later on tonight, but I really believe if John McCain had been elected your president in 2008, we'd be sort of walking down the same road toward more government control, more government regulation, higher government taxation. Thank God Obama got elected because he didn't walk down that road. He ran down that road. And the American people call it the Tea Party movement, call it what you want to call it, but about, and it didn't start with Obama. George W. Bush started to do a lot of this stuff. But the American people kind of went like this. And they said, wait a minute, this doesn't feel right. Our government didn't used to do these things. Our government didn't used to buy up automobile companies. Our government didn't used to tell CEOs how much they can make. Our government didn't used to contemplate taking over what will be one-fifth of our nation's economy. So when I say we're going through a revolution these two visions of America are fighting. One will prevail. And I worry that if we don't get it right this November, I don't know that we can ever get back to the original freedom concept for this country. Totally impacting you all. 
The whole notion of federalism is slipping by the wayside, isn't it? You know, because, because it's this bigger issue of Americans, I got in a lot of trouble a few months ago because I was on a TV show and I said, you know, it just seems to me pretty simple. We complicate things. It's the goal of the Democratic Party to get everybody dependent upon government. That's their goal. I, I wish they would just come out and say it. That's what they want. It makes sense from their perspective. The more people dependent are the more people who need them. So every election, when an election comes around, they will continue to vote for the party of government. Makes sense to me. That's the fight. That's been the overwhelming fight. We've overlooked the second fight that's going right on right now, which is there's a real battle in this country to save the original concept of federalism. Look at what this administration is doing to our states. When a state sneezes, the Obama administration suing them. They're suing South Carolina because South Carolina has just this ridiculous notion, just a, an unbelievable notion that you should have to have a photo ID to vote. Crazy, crazy. So the Obama administration suing South Carolina. Oh, heaven help Arizona. Arizona, you talk about a state out of line. Arizona literally wants to defend its borders. Obama administration sues them. Ohio, just this last week. Ohio wants to make sure that the men and women who serve us in uniform wants to make sure that their votes are counted. And the Obama administration is suing the state of Ohio. And if we don't repeal Obamacare, every state in this country will become a permanent ward of the federal government. Federalism is under threat. All right, so where's Washington at? 87 Republican freshmen got elected. Many of them feel like I do. Many of these freshmen in Congress are first time political people, never run for office. They're, God bless you. They're businessmen, they're business women, they're doctors, they're dentists, who felt as I did two or three years ago, that something's not wrong. I feel like I'm losing my country, we gotta stop it. And many of us get this notion of that this is a long fight. Okay, when you talk about a revolution, when you say your country, you better believe it. When, you better believe it. When you say your country is going through a revolution, folks, this isn't gonna be over in, in, in a year or two or three or an election or two or three. So where Washington's at right now is, and we talk about this when we're in DC, our job when we were elected two years ago was simply to do this to the president. Remember we talked about how he was running? Boy, was he running. Our job was simply to stop him. Our job was not to go to Washington and dramatically cut spending. Our job was not to go to Washington and repeal Obamacare. Our job was not to do lots of the things that I'd love to do. Go to Washington and get rid of the Department of Education and let's just start there. Um, our job was not to go to Washington and give me a simple 15% flat tax across the board, get rid of the estate tax, get rid of the capital gains tax, and let's just start there. Our job was not to go to Washington and, I'll be diplomatic, can we say, revise the EPA. <laughs> um, have a talk with the EPA. Our job, was to go to Washington, step two in this revolution. Step one was the Obama election. Step two was the 2010 reaction. Our job this first two years is just to stand there like this to this president. And generally, we've done it. Generally, we've done it. Um, I'm part of, there are about 22 of us real conservative 
uh, members of Congress, members of the House. The Washington Post called us the Apocalypse Caucus. <laughs> Love that. Love that. These are the guys, like Joe Walsh, who didn't vote for any budget deal. We didn't vote for any debt ceiling deal. We voted against our leadership on all of these things. So I stand before you as one of the more impatient members of Congress. But even I'm happy with what we've done. And maybe it's because I'm a former teacher of American government and American history, and we got a ways to go. It t it's taken, and you all know this, Joe Bass knows this, it's so easy to jump on President Obama. Say that again because it's a lot of fun to say. It's really very easy to jump on President Obama. Um, but in this, in, this, in this grand debate, in this grand revolution about the soul of this country, he's really sort of irrelevant. He doesn't even understand what this country was founded upon. So he's almost irrelevant. It's taken us a long time to get to the point where we're $16 trillion in debt, to get to the point where the unemployment rate in this country isn't 8.3%, it's closer to 15. To get to the point where, unless we dramatically change things, we may, we may not see 3 and 4 and 5% growth for another 20 years. And to get to a point in this country, to get to a point in this country, and I know it's early and I shouldn't be raising my voice and I've only had one cup of coffee, but to get to a point in this country where our government now can look us in the eyes and say, I am going to tax you, I am going to penalize you for not doing something. To get to a point in this country where our government can look a Catholic priest in the eyes and say, I don't care about your faith. I don't care about your faith. You have to provide and pay for products, contraceptive and abortion pills that go against that very faith. It's taken us a long time to get to this point. And so one of my takeaways for all of us here is please, please be patient. You're not going to see anything happen in Washington before the election. After the election, you're going to probably see a really messy couple of months as Congress tries to uh, extend all these tax rates that are going to expire, as Congress tries to figure out what to do with sequestration before it dismantles our military. And the American people need to decide in this election real simple questions. Do they want to keep and expand Obamacare or do they want to get rid of it? Do they want us drilling for oil across the street, or do they not? Do they want Americans keeping more of their own money, or do they not? You all, then, have to live with that uncertainty. Just like American, you know, because you hear from them, American small businessmen and women have to live with how dysfunctional Washington is. Our state governments, who have over the years become almost equally dependent upon the federal government, and we need to change that relationship quickly, you now have to live with our uncertainty as well. Final thought, and then we'll, I'll, we'll open this up to questions. Like the American people, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm campaigning for re-election. Uh, and I have an election in 90 days. And I came up with a campaign slogan that my campaign staff just hates. They said, oh my God, Walsh, you're going to lose votes. The slogan was, it's time for America to grow up. Grow up. I want to I look voters in the eyes and say, it's time to grow up. I'm here from the government, and I'm not going to give you a damn thing. <laughs> uh, Those days are over, okay, okay. 
And again, look guys, we laugh, and my wife knows this, easily once a week I go to bed at night just praying I were a Democrat, wishing I were a Democrat. Because life is so easy if you're a Democrat in Washington. It's like Halloween. You walk around with a bag of candy every day of your life. And you give people things. And you promise people things. And look at the mess that's gotten us into. Because too many Republicans over the years have bought into that same concept. All I want to do is get reelected. To get reelected, I'm going to promise you things. If I give you things, you'll vote for me. And away we go with that dangerous cycle. And that's why we're here. You know what? State governments, state governments... Time for you all to grow up as well. Because if you think the federal government is trying to get every individual in this country dependent upon them, look at what they've done in almost every policy arena. They're trying to get state governments to need them as well. That can't work and we can't let that happen. Let me stop there. Did I get the sign? Okay. Um, and let's open this up. Questions, guys, about anything, any topic. Yes, sir, in the corner. Thank you. Congressman, uh, appreciate your presentation. Uh, all of the states are required to balance the budget. And we do it with some difficulty, but we do it. Uh, Washington hasn't produced a budget for, what, 42 months, something like that? Now, I don't understand why we have an administration that can't produce a budget uh, or a Congress that'll pass it. Uh, we hear about the uh, a presidential race that is so tight that we don't know who's going to win it right now. It seems to me uh, unsensible that the current administration can't produce a budget. Uh, what are people thinking? Oh, gosh, no. It you know, we complicate things in life. We complicate things. And by the way, we're in the state of Illinois. And again, nobody laugh at this. Well, you can laugh at that if you want. Illinois has a balanced budget amendment. Illinois borrows money every year to balance their budget. Every state does, and some are better than others, right? Um, look, the very first bill I introduced in Congress last April was a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution. And I'll tell you, uh, it came last year about 20 votes in getting the sufficient two-thirds to pass out of the House. Never would have passed out of the Senate. Um, but understand something. Everybody in Washington knows two things. Everybody in Washington from Obama to Walsh knows that Medicare, Medicare, Medicare will, is insolvent, will be insolvent in eight to 10 years. It will be gone. And everybody in Washington knows that we are a lot more broke than you know. So what do the courageous people in Washington do? Well, let's look at the Senate. Harry Reid in the Democratic Senate. Here's courage. Here's a portrait in courage. They haven't even proposed a budget in three years. They haven't even proposed a budget. I don't know why they get paid. I don't know what they do. So forget the Senate. The Senate hasn't even put forth a budget. The President, the President of the United States who knows we're broke, knows Medicare will be, fall off a cliff in 10 years, put forth, put, presents a budget this year that, repeat after me, Never, ever, 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 ever balances. Ever. And doesn't mention the word Medicare. So along come these brave House Republicans. Paul Ryan, love them. The House Republicans, we say, well, you know what? We're broke, and Medicare is going to be gone, so we're going to do something about it. So we put forth a House budget that balances in 28 years. <laughs> Don't clap. Don't clap. I almost didn't vote for it. I was this close to not voting for it. 28 years? But even we Republicans were so afraid of doing what's right. And we put forth a plan to save Medicare. 
But if you're 55 or older, nothing changes. If you're younger than 55, we made it optional. We were still so afraid of doing what needs to be done, doing what needs to be done, but you got to understand the context. And this goes back to where Washington is, is right now. Yes, we should balance our budget. We should have a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution, because unless you tie politicians' hands, nothing's going to happen. Hey, here's a great bill, guys. Joe Walsh, a bipartisan guy. This is a Democratic bill. It's called No Budget, No Pay. 77 Republicans and Democrats are on this bill right now. You should call John Boehner, call Nancy Pelosi, tell them, call Pelosi if you have to, <laughs> tell them to bring no budget, no pay to the floor for a vote. It says really simply, if the House doesn't pass a budget and the Senate doesn't pass a budget and they don't come together to make that budget law, nobody gets paid that year. Love it. <laughs> All the way in the back. Welcome. Thank you so much. You're uh, you're singing our song. The uh, you know you had you had uh, uh, Erskine Bowles say you know two years maybe a less maybe a little more until a total total you know, most predictable economic crisis in history. You know David Walker total fiscal collapse. The 30 to 50 percent of all of our budgets that come from the federal government we've seen the high water mark. It's only down from here and and on and on and on. My my, my question and 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 my hope what you could speak into the camera to my colleagues and our colleagues around the nation. With the Budget Control Act, we face 9% of discretionary federal funds going away January 1, in addition to the military that you mentioned, with 30 to 50% of our budgets coming from a federal government that's fiscally suicidal. And, uh, you know, the Medicare and the other issues, we're going to be the ones on the ground to deal with the sick people and the poor people and how to educate our children and provide for public safety. Can you speak on this tape that I can show my colleagues and our colleagues around, around the nation how serious it is and how much we should be doing very serious continuity planning, uh, uh, contingency planning, continuity of government planning for the 30 to 50 percent of our budgets going away? Because, you know, unless there's some pixie fairy dust or a magic wand, I mean, you've got a trillion dollar overspend on a gap basis. It's five trillion dollar a year overspend. I don't see how those numbers work. Can you, can you just put that as seriously and as imminent as it is and, and uh, so we can take that back? Uh. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> think about this, though. Think about this. Think about how dysfunctional Washington is. The president appoints a debt commission, Erskine Bowles. The president's own debt commission, a year and a half later, comes out with their recommendations. And the president, a year and a half ago, ignores his own debt commission. My gosh, if I were his political advisor at the time, I would have turned to him then and said, you push Erskine Bowles 2012 is yours. You can't lose. It tells you his mindset. It tells you how out of it he is. Tom Coburn, a United States senator from Oklahoma, great guy, wrote a book called The Debt Bomb. You talk about scary. Play with the year if you want. But he projects by the year 2020, it's too early in the morning for this, by the year 2020, Coburn says, your federal government will only have enough money to do the following. Service its debt, pay interest on its debt, and pay its Social Security and Medicare obligations. That's it. Imagine he's off by five or six years. <coughs> Imagine he's off by 15 years. How frightening. And you raised the more immediate point of what we did in the Budget Control Act this year, last year, which is we basically kicked the can down the road. Many of us said it was a stupid idea at the time. The whole notion of a super committee was stupid. Then the whole notion of sequestration was stupid. I'd like to tell you there's still going to be some pixie dust, and there may well be because Washington's great at finding pixie dust late in the game. I can tell you nobody in Washington wants sequestration to happen on the defense side. 
all Republicans and enough Democrats want that to be delayed or stopped, that they'll be, I mean, we've already gotten, you've gotten probably in many of your areas and districts, defense companies already preparing for major, major layoffs. I wish I could be as hopeful on the non-defense discretionary side, the hit that you all are going to take. We're more likely to take a hit there. So when you combine that with the expansion in Medicaid and all this other stuff, I, boy, part of me would rather be in Washington than where you are. Yes, sir. We have a question here first, if you don't Oh, go ahead. Right there. Thank you for being here. I'm Jeremy Faison from Tennessee, and I just have two small questions. I'm wondering, do your colleagues, and I, I don't mean to this to be tongue-in-cheek, but do they understand what $15 trillion is? Can I stop you? Yes, sir. By the time I'm done talking in three hours, I won't. <laughs> <laughs> it's not $15 trillion. We're, we're hugging 16 now. God, no. and, and then my final question. First of all, that's unsustainable. But I hear Obama and, and people in Washington talking about Medicare or Social Security being cut. What, what would be, listen, that's money that these people paid in their entire lives. It's not your money to decide to cut. Why can't we cut the people who haven't paid in? Here's, Why can't we start at food stamps and welfare and Medicaid? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, great point. Great question. And it's not an either or. It's not an either or. Everything needs to be cut. When I say things like, get rid of the Department of Education tomorrow, get rid of energy, get rid of commerce, Rick Perry had a few others that he, that he, <laughs> get, and when I say, when I say, come home from Afghanistan tomorrow, bring our boys and girls home tomorrow, we'll save $110 billion. Get rid of oil subsidies if you want, we'll get, uh, we'll save $18 billion. We need to do all of these things. Because our government is doing things it shouldn't do. And that's hurting us as a country. But if you want to save our kids and our grandkids from the cliff, the financial cliff that they're going to live with, you have got to, as a government, address the fact that 10,000 Americans are retiring every day. And they're not living till they're 62 or 3 or 4. Thank God, we're living till we're 92 or three or four. The biggest, fastest growing piece of the federal budget is health care costs for our aging population. Nothing comes close. And until your federal government gets the courage to deal with these entitlements, we're sunk. Final point I'll make. Heck yeah, I hear it at every town hall I have. I paid into Medicare, Congressman Walsh. I paid into it. Yes, you did. But understand something right now. The average recipient of Medicare right now paid in about $115,000 over the course of their working life. They're getting back three times that now in medical care. That discrepancy continues to grow every year. Not sustainable. Thank you. I'm Betty Grandy from um, North Dakota. I represent there. Thank you. Um, the, the state that is trying to prosper even despite what Washington's trying to do to us. Um, w one of the things you mentioned, and I appreciate the fact that you brought in the balanced budget amendment, but I want you to focus on and, and explain about strong balanced budget amendment versus this balanced budget amendment that gets thrown around. Because we can't just go with a balanced budget amendment and the states have to re start realizing this too. North Dakota talks about we have a balanced budget. No, we don't, because it's not a strong balanced budget. We tax ourselves into that. And we have to address that even at the Washington level and get the proper language. We need to win the, wor the war on words. Yes. And Washington's losing at that, and the states are starting to lose that war on words. And could you address that a little bit? Yeah, the, the, the balanced budget amendment that I introduced last spring was the strong balanced budget amendment made it almost impossible to raise taxes, and had a real spending cap. And the House fought over this, and that's what passed out of the House. Um, but there were a number of Republican colleagues that didn't mind what we'll call the weaker balanced budget amendment, which just simply says, Washington, balance your books every year. It wasn't my preferred choice, but 
many of my colleagues like the idea of, all right, if every year we have to have the raise taxes or cut spending fight, you know what, that's a fight I wouldn't mind having every year. And I wouldn't mind making Democrats and some Republicans be on record for supporting raising taxes. Um, so I, I'm, I'm inclined to support almost any balanced budget amendment because I'd like that political fight. But I really do prefer, as you say, the stronger, stronger balanced budget amendment. Because, look, I wish this is one issue, one issue that Mitt Romney would be stronger on. My God, stand up. Stand up for the fact that you've been successful. And this is your money. And you want every American to be successful. And yes, you want to keep more of your money. And I want everybody in this room to keep more money, more of the money you make. And stand up for not increasing anybody's taxes. And why don't Republicans say more often? It's like we run away from this revenue fight. I'm going to raise my hands. Follow me. I, Joe Walsh, want to raise government revenues. That's part of this whole equation. But I don't raise taxes to raise revenues. I cut taxes because I want to increase taxpayers. Why don't we say that? Why are we so, so afraid? Yes. Last question. Thank you for being here, uh, Congressman Walsh. I'm Hal Wick from South Dakota. That's just a little bit south of uh, North Dakota. <laughs> We don't have the oil yet. Slow down. We Where don't, is it? We don't have the oil yet. Yes. But we have a governor that, thank God, really decided we're not going to fool around with budgets. So we cut $127 million last year and finished this year with $48 million surplus. And I'm, I'm looking at one of the things I asked Christy Noem to do, and you know who she is. Yes. Um, our congressperson. And Great said, lady. why don't you do like we do in South Dakota? You know we've done it here, but sunset, every department, start with, um, start with energy. They only spend $24 billion and don't do anything. Then we can do education when we show that we can do something. But what will it take for us to get enough people there that you and the other 86 can be successful? Great, great, uh, great, great final question to end on. Sort of, what would I like to do if I were king of the world? Um, it's, and I'm going to answer your question, and if I don't, you can pull me aside afterwards. We know what needs to be done to save this country. It's actually unbelievably simple. We need to cut taxes and simplify the code so that Americans can keep more of their own money. We need to reform these entitlement programs quickly. We need to cut government spending and limit what government does, and I'm exaggerating, but we need to start drilling for oil right outside this hotel. We need an aggressive domestic energy policy. We know what needs to be done. The problem is not everybody in Washington agrees with those four things. The problem is not everybody among the 242 Republican members of the House are on board with those four things. So I'm going to leave you with a very depressing message. Enjoy your breakfast. Enjoy lunch. You're going to have a great speaker for dinner tonight. But be patient. This is going to take a while. Washington is unbelievably messed up. But you know what? We're not all that sleepy-eyed, and we're not all that old, and we're not all that cynical to still get this. It wasn't that long ago that our founders, our founders risked everything to start this country. It wasn't that long ago. And if you want some good reading for the month of August, grab a book and read about what our founders went through. Read about what they put on the line. And over the course of the last 230 some years, men and women have died to try to preserve this. We have begun this fight. It's not easy. I had a full head of black hair six months ago. <laughs> That's a lie. 
This is going to take a while, and it's not going to be easy. And I, 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 I empathize with you all because you're, you have to live with what we're doing. But it's going to, look, if our job, if our job this first election in 2010, as the freedom-loving Americans fired their first shot across the bow, was to take the House back, our first job was to stop this president. Our next job is to be successful this election and then demand that the Republicans in Washington be bold and deliver on a couple of the four things I, I outlined in my agenda. If the Republicans aren't bold, if you give Romney the White House and you get rid of Harry Reid and you give the Republicans the Senate and we keep the House and the Republicans don't do what they should do to limit government and preserve freedoms, I tell John Boehner this all the time, something else is coming. Thank you, God bless.